Hello and welcome to the CPRI Knowledge Hub's Research Minutes podcast, where we interview researchers whose work is impacting the education field in a big way. This week, CPRI co-director John Sapothit sits down with Drew Gatomer and Courtney Bell, co-editors of the latest handbook on the research of teaching. So I'm here. I'm here with Drew Gatomer and Courtney Bell. Drew is the Rosa Nicholas DeMarzo Chair in Education at Rutgers University, and Courtney is a Senior Research Scientist at ETS, Education Testing Services. And um, they are the proud editorial parents of the fifth handbook of research on teaching, uh, which just came out in May 2016 um, at the hefty size of over 1,500 pages and uh, has a veritable who's who list of authors um, who are uh, very well-known education researchers. So uh, Drew and Courtney, uh, this is the fifth handbook and the, the last one came out in 2001, so it's been 15 years. And so I'm just wondering about how, how this volume is different from its predecessors and what's your sense of how this reflects how the field has changed? Each chapter is lengthy but each chapter also had to make a set of intellectual decisions about how to cut through the literature. We asked authors not to be encyclopedic in their reviews. We wanted them to take a slice through their area uh, and to to actually to take on co-authors that uh, would help broaden their particular area of expertise. So uh, readers will also notice that the areas that a particular chapter spans are much broader than just a single author's expertise. Um, and that was very deliberate. So that does, I think, in, in our view, reflect a, the broader need in the field of education to deal with problems versus very narrow, um, specific academic areas. It is true that over these 15 years, From the previous volume, there has been a proliferation of handbooks of all types. And so we deliberately did not want this handbook to try to replicate that kind of very deep, meaty work that is done in, like, let's say, the handbook of research on science teaching or something like that. So this handbook really shifts away from that. And that is, I think, in direct response to the increasing specialization in our field and to the increasing um, proliferation of handbooks more generally. So it's just it's striking to me that you organized your your mm-hmm. the handbook in this way, but it do, but it, it in some ways you know um, is a very different way to think than the way that the that the research system is structured to go at these problems. Yeah, I think to a person, uh, certainly we felt this, and I think every author felt that this did represent a challenge to sort of uh, typical ways of conceptualizing domains and the typical kinds of writing tasks that people undertake. And we encouraged um, uh, multiple authorship. And and you'll see in many cases authors who haven't typically uh, written together actually participating in the writing of these chapters, particularly because you, we did need to bring in folks, if we're taking a problem-centered approach, who came from came to this from different sorts of perspectives. Um, I think in large part those collaborations were, were quite successful, and the hope is that it does move the field. One of the things that we had in mind as we wrote this was a sense of audience, and we thought about this in terms of uh, graduate students who are entering the field and can very easily be led, be led into sort of this balkanized structure of the field. And second, we thought about people who were interested in exploring um, a domain who might not be expert in it, but wanted to um, be able to enter into that domain and understand the terrain. Uh, and, and, and so with that perspective, these chapters we thought made this this kind of organization made some sense. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm curious about how, how you after after editing this volume, how you came away thinking about the current state of educational research on teaching. I think for me the the 
a few of the surprising uh, things as we worked with the authors and then tried to step back was while there really are um, tremendous uh, battles, both about the the truth of a particular finding, let's say, whether one variable is related to another or what causes something else like that, but also sort of paradigm kinds of things like the divide in, in the um, social studies area between researchers that study in general t the teaching and learning of history versus the teaching and learning of social studies or civics, more orientation, those are examples of those divides. One of the things that, that was striking, and I think this is in part because of the authors that we selected and their natural epistemological orientations, is they were trying to create narratives that were synthetic. And so while, of course, they point out many of these um, disconnects or divides, they try to impose a narrative on the research that helps us see what is similar, where there are areas that we have moved forward on. And so you know, even just the fact that people seem to be using a socio-cognitive or socio-cultural approach, and that that's pretty uniform across the field, was pretty interesting to notice. So there were things like that that came up from looking across the chapters. I think one of the other really big ones that was quite striking was the lack of the sort of methodological divides that we see, this sort of if if we are at all as a field obsessed with the qualitative-quantitative divide, the methodological chapter and then each of the other chapters that reviews empirical research would tell you that that divide is not a divide, a binary, in the way that it often gets kind of glibly referred to. And that is heartening, I think, um, that there are people, whether they're teaming with other researchers, maybe one is a qualitative researcher, the other is a quantitative, and they're writing papers and publishing books and those kinds of things that cross over those methodological divides, it is also very heartening to see those kinds of um, convergences coming up more. Uh, is that Are those kinds of things solved? For sure not. But, but it does seem like this volume helps us see where there has been progress on some of those big disconnects. I think the other thing I would add is that for the young researcher, the encouraging thing is that there's a tremendous opportunity. There are plenty. There are a tremendous number of places where there, the research is actually kind of thin, and there are lots of problems that need to be explored. And so, while there's an abundance of research to address many of the problems, we were struck in certain areas where it turns out the research was um, was limited. And so, there's lots of opportunities for people to make a contribution going forward. So that, that was going to be my next question about what, what do you see as some of the next frontiers? Are there particular things that you can point to that, that seem to be areas that, are, are, um, that this body of work points to as, as areas for fruitful investigation? Well, a big one that I think sociologists um, have struggled with historically over hundreds of years is what I'll just refer to as sort of the structure and agency divide in sociology. But here in research on teaching, it's this kind of what is the relationship between what is happening inside of classrooms, between the instructional triangle of students, teachers, and content. What's happening there vis-a-vis -vis the structural influences that are outside. So if you imagine that schools are embedded, or classrooms are embedded in schools and are embedded in districts and are embedded in states and then the nation. A number of scholars have pointed to and begun to make inroads into understanding how, for example, um, take as a case in point the, the proliferation of charter schools and choice and neoliberal thinking in markets has gone on to shape the work of teaching inside of inside of classrooms, like are teachers able to actually do different things? Is the work with kids and with content different because of these more structural sort of choice, the movement that has happened over the last 20-ish years? The, that space, the relationship between structure and the insides of classrooms is a very critical, important, under-theorized space and people are just beginning to tap into it. It seems like that is a really rich place in all kinds of areas to be working in. Well, th thank you both so much. This this has been a really, really provocative and interesting conversation. Um, I, um, I appreciate your time. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Research Minutes. Listen to our latest interviews by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. And you can continue to join the conversation by heading to seaprehub.org.